broadcasting is the National Hurricane Center in Miami, and it's Talk responsible. is about the use of essential ocean variables in sustainable development. And we'll talk about how the ocean is changing, why we observe the oceans, what are essential ocean variables, and we'll finish off with a bit of a focus on ocean acidification. Life depends on the oceans. They make up the planet's largest ecosystem and cover more than two thirds of the Earth's surface and provide billions of people with food and livelihoods. Oceans produce about half of the oxygen that we breathe, act as a climate regulator, absorb, absorb atmospheric heat and carbon dioxide, and they provide valuable fisheries, and more than 90% of the world's goods are traded via the ocean. Of course, the ocean supports many industries, which include fisheries, aquaculture, shipping, oil and gas, tourism, cruise ships, long, long list of things. So there's a social and cultural reliance on healthy oceans. There's currently 7.85 billion people on the planet, as opposed to only 2 billion people 100 years ago. This increase in population has caused increased utilization of land resources and fossil fuel consumption. We are all aware now of climate change. The figure on the left is showing the evolution of atmospheric carbon dioxide since 1958. And according to the daily CO2 chart, there's currently 418 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. Increasing concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide also cause the temperature in to increase. And that's what's shown in the animation on the right. So as we travel through time, we see more CO2 and higher temperatures. The Anthropocene Epoch is an unofficial unit of geological time, and it's used to describe the most recent period in Earth's history when human activity started to have a significant impact on the planet's climate and ecosystems. We're living at a time where the human impact on the Earth system is growing quite out of control. An awareness of the influence we have on our planet is prevalent in the scientific community, and it's also becoming increasingly widespread in mainstream media and in the minds of policymakers. A great example of this is the Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding international treaty on climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and finance created within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And as we discussed earlier, the overall outcome is to make sure that we don't raise the temperature of the planet by more than 1.5 degrees. A changing climate also means a changing ocean. So we all know that the ocean covers 71% of the surface of the planet, and half of the surface of the planet is ocean beyond any national jurisdiction. So therefore, it's a global commons whose stewardship is the common responsibility of all of mankind. Now, a bit closer to home for you is the Caribbean is 95% ocean. So finding solutions to sustainability concerns require a concerted approach. And this extends across all levels of society, from policymakers to scientists and the general public. The ocean is getting hotter. It absorbs 93% of excess heat from the environment. Global average for sea surface warming between 1971 and 2010 is 0.1 degrees per decade in the upper ocean. But some areas of the Caribbean have experienced amplified warming of 0.2 to 0.5 degrees per decade. The recent SST increases are greatest throughout the Windward Islands of the Lesser Antilles, such as Grenada, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Lucia. The predicted temperature increase in the Caribbean by the end of the century is approximately two to three degrees, 
So this exceeds the target that we're looking for from the Paris Agreement. Warming ocean waters threaten marine ecosystems and human livelihoods. For example, warm waters jeopardize the health of corals and in turn the communities of marine life that depend on those for shelter and food. And ultimately, the people who depend upon marine fisheries for food and jobs will face negative impacts from ocean warming. The sea level is also rising. It's risen by 21 to 24 centimeters since 1880. And the pace of global sea level rise more than doubled from 1.4 millimeters per year throughout most of the 20th century to 3.6 millimeters per year between 2006 and 2015. So at the moment, the warming of ocean water is raising global sea level because when water expands, it expands as it warms. Combine this with water melting from glaciers on land, the rising sea threatens natural ecosystems and human structures near coastlines around the world. It's predicted that by 2100, there'll be a one to two meter sea level rise. The Bahamas, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Belize and the Caribbean are at the greatest loss in terms of absolute economic terms. The oceans are also becoming more acidic. So on a yearly basis, about a quarter of excess carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by the ocean. And this changes the carbon chemistry of the ocean because atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolves into the seawater and forms carbonic acid and hydrogen ions. And as you can see, the pH has slowly been decreasing over time. And we've seen a decrease from about 8.2 to 8.05 pH units over the last hundred years. And this sounds like a small number, but it is a very large decrease and it's happened very quickly. Now, ocean acidification reduces the amount of carbonate ions that are required for things like corals and shellfish to make their shells and skeletons and increases the amount of energy it takes to build those structures. As some people believe that ocean acidification will not be reversible for seven generations. Right now, the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was in pre-industrial times, and some predictions suggest that the ocean will be 70% more acidic by the end of the century. The ocean is also losing oxygen. Now, oxygen is critical for most life in the ocean. The heating up of the ocean increases how stratified the ocean is, so where the layers are, and reduces the contact of the ocean with the atmosphere. So there's less opportunity for oxygen to cross from the atmosphere into the water. And a warming ocean also means it's more difficult for the oxygen to dissolve, so it becomes less soluble. Since the mid 20th century, one to 2% of the global ocean oxygen inventory was lost, and over 700 coastal sites have reported new or worsening low oxygen conditions. And we can see those particularly in the red points on this figure here. Now, oxygen's fundamental for life and biogeochemical processes. In coastal and shelf regions and semi-enclosed seas, Overfertilization of waters, largely from agriculture or sewage, creates algal blooms that die and decay, which consumes a lot of oxygen. The oceans are also becoming more polluted. The figure in the top left is clean water scores from 220 coastal regions. And the red areas are the most polluted, and the blue areas are the least polluted. And so the oceans get polluted by many different things, particularly plastic, uh, nutrients, chemicals. Of course, the oceans are being overfished. 
marine populations have declined more than 50% just since the 1970s, and 90% of fish stocks are overfished and overexploited. And it's not just commercial species that are being removed, but millions of marine animals are killed as bycatch, like turtles and sharks. Now, wild fish populations are decreasing, but the human dependence on fish as a food resource is increasing. And the oceans are hazardous. More than half of human population lives in the coastal zone. And this, of course, exposes many people to ocean-related hazards, like tsunamis, storm surges, high waves, and these all pose hazards to human health and coastal property. And also mariners have particular needs for weather and ocean hazard forecasts to prevent harm to themselves. A study by Halpern et al found that most of the ocean, so 59%, is experiencing significantly increasing cumulative impact. So cumulative impact is all of the stresses put together, they all interact with each other and join up to build one big problem. But particular culprits are climate change, fishing, land-based pollution, and shipping. So this figure is less scary than it looks, I promise. And it shows the annual pace of change in cumulative human impacts per year across 21 different marine ecosystems globally in the coastal zone from these 14 different stresses, like the different fishing, different types of pollution, sea level rise, acidification, and sea surface temperature. Um, the stresses are color coded. So the stresses here, you can find them in these bar charts. The bars going out, which is most of them, they're greater than zero. So this means that increasing impacts. So those impacts are getting bigger during that time frame. And the bars pointing towards the middle, they're cumulative impacts that have got better over the time frame. So if we just take a look at this Latin America and Caribbean section, we can see that the Caribbean is suffering the most cumulative impacts from climate change, such as sea surface temperature, sea level rise and ocean acidification. There's a lot of pink in these graphs. And shipping is also increasing, pollution is also increasing. The Caribbean countries with the highest cumulative impacts are Grenada, Bonaire, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the lowest down here we have Cuba, Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas. What I noticed about the things reducing that seems to be mostly the impacts from fishing. So fishing practices must be improving. And from the same study, this figure on the left shows the annual change in those 14 impacts, rising the, the cumulative impacts for each of these different marine ecosystems like coral reefs, rocky reefs, seamounts, shelves, beach. The ecosystems with the highest cumulative human impacts are coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves. And I know that there's going to be lots of conversations about those three particular ecosystems over the course of the next couple of weeks. And again, we can see that climate change is really the biggest problem for these ecosystems. So we have lots of problems from sea surface temperature, OA, and sea level rise. The figure on the right shows cumulative impacts on the global marine ecosystems for just a single year. So this shows the impacts in just 2013. And the highest impact is from direct human impacts on mangroves here. So it probably refers to the re removal of mangroves for coastal development. 
But overall, the most significant impacts, again, is from sea surface temperature and ocean acidification, which have a heavy impact on almost every type of marine ecosystem that they assessed. The UN's SDG Goal 14 focuses on assessing and reducing cumulative pressures to the oceans and the upcoming renegotiation of the HE biodiversity targets. And these will benefit from a deeper understanding of the pace and pattern of change in cumulative impacts. Furthermore, the accelerating rate of creating marine protected areas to meet convention on biological diversity targets of 10% of the ocean within protected area by 2020, and the push globally to create really large MPAs could benefit from detailed maps of where and how fast cumulative impacts are changing. So this information is critical to siting and managing effective protective areas. So how can we monitor all of the issues that we've just seen? A great place to start is by measuring essential ocean variables. The concept of essential variables was first used by the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, in the 1990s. Now, essential ocean variables are parameters known to be critical for observing and monitoring marine ecosystems. And the idea is that these essential ocean variables, EOVs, will be sustained long-term measurements. Consistent measurements of EOVs need to be maintained over time to accurately serve as a means to monitor and assess change to ocean systems. EOVs are separated into three main categories. We've got physics, which includes things like sea state, surface temperature, current salinity. We have biogeochemistry, which includes things like oxygen, nutrients, and carbon, and biology and ecosystems. So there we've got things like plankton biomass, fish abundance, and coral cover, for example. EOVs are determined by panels of experts from across multiple agencies and disciplines, and they're chosen based on a number of factors. Things like how effective is the variable in addressing climate change, operational ocean services, or ocean health? How evolved and accessible is the technology required to measure that variable? And how expensive is it to measure? So we have how useful measuring that variable is going to be. So the impact of measuring that versus the feasibility. So can we actually do a good job of measuring that variable? And that's how the EOVs are selected, because we can't measure everything, and nor does anybody want to either. As well as deciding which variables are essential to measure, the panel also comes to a consensus on how these measurements are going to be made. That means there's a strict set of requirements in terms of data resolution, so how often, how frequent you sample, how often you measure that variable, and across what kind of spatial resolution you measure those variables. And obviously also uh, requirements on data quality. So the advantage of having such uh, good definitions of EOVs is that there's a common set of accurate and sustained measurements with standards for data collection and dissemination. And this ensures the usability of data across multiple platforms and agencies. Each variable has an EOV specification sheet, and this is full of really useful information. And it includes things like the background and justification of that variable. It has a list of scientific questions that collecting that data can be useful for. It talks about the scales of processes to be addressed and the techniques required to make to measure the variable. 
and loads, loads more information. They're really interesting to look at. And you can find these by going onto the Global Ocean Observing System website at gooseocean.org, click on essential variables, and then you'll see a list of all the variables. And if you click on whichever variable you want, it will open up a specification sheet. At this slide here, I'm just showing some screen snaps from the subsurface temperature variable. I just picked one at random. And down on the bottom left, you can see the temporal and spatial scale that this kind of data can be collected at. And you get quite a range. You can look at small spaces on short time scales, like daily or weekly events, or long-term time scales, tens or hundreds of years, and up to really large regions. And also on the right, we have interesting information about what equipment you can use to gather this information. We put in sensors on different types of platforms and how what kind of spatial sampling you would use those for. So take a browse through some of the sheets that you measure yourself or that you would be interested in measuring. They're, they're really, really helpful. The creation of essential ocean variables are largely driven by societal needs, ensuring a solid observational framework to guide policy through essential ocean variables. The message from Goose is that we can't manage what we don't measure. As we saw earlier, human well being, safety, and prosperity are tightly linked to the global ocean, yet, the ocean is under increasing amounts of human impact. Now, observational data becomes more valuable as data is collected over long periods of time. So sustained ocean observations are better. But of course, you need to start somewhere. So, but that way, there are no or fewer gaps in the data records, and you can capture short term or annual variability and gain an improved scientific understanding of how a certain variable or ecosystem works now. So once a baseline has been established, you'll then be able to start observing any change that comes later on. But ocean observations provide accurate descriptions of the present state of the oceans. They can be used for continuous forecasts of future conditions of the sea, provide the basis of forecasts for climate change, be used for ecosystem assessment and management, so placing marine protected areas, or using the information for science-based policy implementation for healthy ecosystems and a healthy economy. So I quite like this biology and ecosystems category. This was the most recent addition to the family of EOVs. And I, I felt that adding biological EOVs demonstrated the recognition that the need for ocean observations extends beyond those needed for climate observations and increase the need to connect to societal issues in the coastal zone. Now, this study identified nine different societal drivers for establishing biological EOVs from 24 international conventions and agreements. So each of these drivers and pressures targets different issues which drive biological responses to changing oceans. So our drivers include sustained economic growth, capacity building, sustainable use of biodiversity, access to data, food security, environmental quality, and more. And the segments between the drivers, so the green lines represent similarity. So the shorter and closer the lines are, the more similar those drivers are. And these horizontal bars on the graphs, they represent the pressures addressed concurrently with those drivers. So pressures like mining, noise, acidification, loss of habitat. So overall, the main simulations for biological EOVs are these nine drivers. 
And since we've been talking a little bit about sustainable goal 14, life below the water, we can look at the list and see how measuring essential ocean variables uh, can help to meet those targets of SDG 14. And it will provide a more coordinated, effective and efficient monitoring system for meeting these SDG targets. Particularly when you look at things like, let's pick one, ending overfishing, we can measure those biological variables of fish biomass, for example. So let's take another short 10 minute break there. Um, please add any questions to the chat if you have any, or if you have any that you would like to share now, then please just raise your hand. Uh, just having a look through the questions, and there was just a request to recap on the essential ocean variables. Uh, basically, the essential ocean variables are different parameters that we can measure in the ocean, and they're separated into three different groups. So physical parameters like sea ice and sea temperature, or biogeochemical uh, variables like inorganic carbon, nutrients, oxygen, or biological and ecosystem variables like hard coral cover, seagrass cover, these types of things. And these variables have been determined by a panel of experts that those are the most useful variables and also the most feasible variables. So by collecting that data, we can have more outcomes from having those data. And also it's possible to measure that data more easily. So we have the technology available. And um, there is a link in the chat to the Goose website, and there you'll find a list of every essential ocean variable. And if you click on any of them, then it will open the specification sheet. And the specification sheet are written by the panels of experts, and it will tell you what's, what data you need to collect, how you can collect it, um, what kind of scientific questions you can answer by collecting that data, spatial resolutions, and how it will help society. Um, so please do try and go onto the website and click through some of the essential ocean variables, and they're really interesting to look through. So um, Marcia says that she can't see ocean acidification in that list. Uh, so that will be in the inorganic carbon. And so that will have uh, PCO2 dissolved in organic carbon, pH and total alkalinity. So there's different variables of the carbonate system that we can measure to determine ocean acidification. No problem. Um, I think that's if questions, if not, please just keep them coming and we can go through them at the end. I don't seem to be able to scroll up very high on the list. <laughs> so, Vimani, if anything else pops up and I don't see it, then just let me know at the end. I'll keep looking out for questions. All right, I'll just open up my presentation. All right, is that working for everybody? Yes. Great, thank you very much. So for the next half of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the ecological and social impacts of ocean acidification and how essential ocean variables can be used to help manage and alleviate the consequences of an acidifying ocean. And corals contribute many ecosystem services. Coral reefs provide shelter and food for an estimated 25% of known marine fish species and account for between 9-12% to of world fish landings and provide food and livelihood security to more than 500 million people worldwide. 
The Caribbean has an estimated 26,000 kilometers squared of coral reef, and that equates to 7% of the world's shallow coral reefs. Coral reefs are a vital line of defense and protect coastlines and mangroves from storm damage and storm surges. The Caribbean region is more dependent on tourism than any other region in the world, and the sector accounts for over 15% of GDP and 13% of jobs in the region. And almost all visitors to the Caribbean take part in some activity that relates to coral reefs, either directly like snorkeling and scuba diving, or indirectly like going to the beach or eating fresh seafood. This means that the health of the Caribbean's tourism industry, and thus the whole regional economy, is dependent on the health of its coral reefs. Reef adjacent activities alone generate an estimated $5.7 billion per year in the Caribbean from roughly 7.4 million visitors. So when combined with reef dependent tourism activities, they generate almost $8 billion in total. Uh, coral reefs also, they just provide habitat for fish and invertebrates, a space for recreational activities. And also interestingly, it's believed that coral reefs harbor a number of organisms and microbes that may provide useful pharmaceutical compounds, which can be used to treat diseases such as cancer and arthritis. So this is really an area of developing research. Recap, ocean acidification is one of the biggest climate threats to coral reefs. As we learned earlier, ocean acidification is largely caused by the dissolution of atmospheric carbon dioxide into seawater, forming carbonic acid. As the water becomes more acidic, it reduces the availability of carbonate ions, and these are essential in the building of coral skeletons because they're made from calcium plus carbonate. It's more difficult to determine the extent of acidification in coastal regions than in the open ocean. So the pH of coral reef water is not the same as the open ocean because the chemistry of open ocean water changes as it moves across the reef as a direct result of processes like photosynthesis, calcification, carbonate sediment dissolution, and other local anthropogenic stresses. So the longer the residence time, so how long that package of water stays on the reef, the more profound the change will be. In this figure here, we'll just concentrate on sections C and G. We can see an open ocean pH signal in blue over the space of five years, and a reef pH in orange over the same time period. So this is data from Bermuda. And you'll see that in the orange, so the coral reef pH, it's much more variable and much less predictable than this nice smooth open ocean pH signal. And each reef has its own unique pH signal over both long and short time scales. Um, so here we have long-term data from Bermuda, the Canary Islands, and Hawaii. And overall, you can see that there's this ocean acidification signal, but behind this, each reef has its own magnitude of variability. So at the talk on Wednesday, Sarah Cryer is going to be showing some pH data collected by NOx CMAP ocean acidification kits deployed in different CMEP countries. So the impact of ocean acidification on coral colonies themselves is that there'll be decreased calcification because as we already said, acidification reduces the amount of carbonate ions available. And also, as the ocean becomes more acidic, it costs the corals more energy to produce their skeleton. So 
we have decreased calcification from ocean acidification. An example from the Great Barrier Reef suggests that over the space of 20 years, ocean acidification caused a 20% decrease in calcification rates. It's anticipated that future ocean acidification will affect coral growth and also coralline algae growth. So it'll change the structure of the reef and its integrity. So what we have in these pictures here is corals that were grown under acidified conditions. And these images, you can see cracks in the skeleton because they just can't make their skeleton as well as they can in less acidic waters. So by having these structural defects and reduced skeleton density, the corals become more susceptible to erosion. And if the ocean becomes acidic enough, then they will actually start to dissolve. Now, how does this work on an ecosystem scale? Ocean acidification will lead to a decline in coral cover. It will reduce rugosity. So that's the shape of the reef and the shape of the reef is determined by uh, the, the diversity of coral species. And the more rugged a reef is, the more marine life it harbors. So there'll be a habitat loss and probably a shift towards more macroalgae instead of coral. And the corals will become more susceptible to disease, more susceptible to breaking and more susceptible to sea level rise because if they can't continue the rate of growth as they are now, as the sea level rises, then the corals just won't be able to grow enough to keep up with the rate of sea level change. And what we see in this picture here is a before and after picture from Carries Fort Reef in Florida. On the left, in 1972, you can see this really vibrant reef, lots of different branching corals, alcorns, lots of fish, bright colors. And then in 2013, this reef is basically non-existent. So ocean acidification is going to have an impact on marine food resources because we're expecting there to be a knock-on effect on fish because the fish like to live in the coral reefs. And the contribution of marine protein to global food security is substantial. So fish, including shellfish, contribute 15% of animal protein to 3 billion people worldwide. A further 1 billion people rely on fisheries for their primary source of protein. And fish are even more important in countries where other protein sources decline seasonally. Ocean acidification could have significant consequences on marine organisms, which may be a threat to food security. So a reduction in coral cover and coral diversity will, of course, decrease the abundance of reef dependent species, resulting in negative nutritional and economic impacts for the people who depend on them. In the Mesoamerican reef ecosystem, ocean acidification will have an impact on commercial fisheries such as queen conch, spiny lobsters, groupers and snappers. If we take the spiny lobsters as an example, we can see that they're a particularly valuable resource to the Caribbean as they're worth nearly 500 million US dollars annually. They'll be particularly impacted by ocean acidification though. Uh, for example, a reduction in pH will alter their ability to respond to chemical signals in the water appropriately, which affects settlement and recruitment because at a larval stage, they won't choose the best place to live. And also reducing the pH changes their ability to sense disease. So normally they can smell out disease in their peers and they won't really approach them, much like we're all trying to do with coronavirus right now. So the lobsters won't quarantine themselves from each other and that to be, lead to a 
faster spread of disease. So uh, how can how can monitoring EOBs help to manage the impacts of the ocean acidification? As previously mentioned, there are multiple factors enhancing ocean acidification in coastal reef environment in comparison to the open ocean. So coastal acidification is also caused by the dissolution of carbon dioxide, but it's also further stimulated by point source pollution, such as sewage discharge or freshwater input, nutrient input from fertilizers and terrestrial runoff, or even microbial activity and upwelling from the deep oceans. But the good news is that most of these variables can be effectively controlled by policy and legislation. The bad news is that there's so many variables impacting pH in the coastal zone it's actually really hard to determine the main driver at a local scale, and it won't be the same everywhere. So for example, if we reduce the amount of nutrient runoff by 50%, how big of an impact will this have on managing local pH? Those kinds of questions can be answered using monitoring data. Lots of different EOVs. And so that's where the EOVs come in handy. And such problems also demonstrate the benefit of measuring multiple EOVs. So not just measuring pH or dissolved in organic carbon, but measuring other things like particulate matter or nutrients or oxygen, or doing transit lines of hard coral cover and seagrass cover. Adding all of these things to your arsenal will help to assess where the acidification is coming from and how successful any, any activities to reduce ocean acidification are working. An example of how some of these EOVs have been measured include the Coral Reef Early Warning System, a collection of surface and subsurface sensors in multiple Caribbean countries, including Belize, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago. And I noticed, Arlene, uh, you have something to say about these. Maybe you could talk to us about this at the end. Um, other examples include reef check coral surveys. So monitoring which corals are there and how, how much of the reef they cover. And of course, in the bottom right, we have a picture of our Noxema ocean acidification kit which some of you are going to hear a lot more about over the next couple of days. There's a web link here to the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network because they accept data from a variety of observing platforms, including national, local, and institutional monitoring programs, not just for ocean acidification, but any other of these EOVs. It's a real good data repository. And also I've suggested a paper here by Obura et al. in 2019 called Coral Reef Monitoring, Reef Assessment Technologies and Ecosystem-Based Management. It's open access, so you should all be able to read it. And it's just a really nice summary of different EOVs that we can measure to monitor coral reef health. So back to ocean acidification, it's occurring alongside other climate related stresses like ocean warming, sea level rise, changes in rain and storms. So these are all compounded as well by non-climate related impacts like overfishing and pollution. And all of these just add lots of pressure to an already strained marine ecosystem. And that's an ecosystem that people are relying on for food. So the combination of rising temperature with increasing acidity on organisms is likely to be worse than either of those factors on their own. For example, the range of temperature tolerance for the edible crab may be reduced in more acidic waters. So the impacts of ocean acidification to society are very complex and scientists are only now just starting to understand them and unravel 
this tangled web of impacts. And the scientific and policy needs for coordinated worldwide information gathering on ocean acidification and its ecological impacts is recognized by the UN General Assembly and by many government and non-government bodies. And that's resulted in the creation of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. So that's another really great online resource if you're interested in ocean acidification. Now, as well as monitoring these EOVs, there's other ways to, to manage ocean acidification, but we can see here in closing the knowledge gap, we do have water chemistry monitoring, but this kind of data can be used to make policy, to enforce water quality rules or climate emissions, and the data can also be used to educate a community or government level, and it can be used to help manage for resilience so if you wanted to restore some ecosystems or in, incorporate new marine protected areas, all this kind of EOV data is really beneficial to all of these ways to help limit the impacts from ocean acidification. One resource I found that was particularly interesting is the Ocean Acidification Alliance. And if you go onto their website, they have um, guidelines for making an action plan. It's not compulsory, it's just something I think is really interesting if you want to go and have a look. Um, but action plans describe real tangible actions that members are taking or will take to better understand and respond to the threats of ocean acidification and other climate ocean stressor impacts. And they're built to guide regulatory and non-regulatory actions. Um, other things that the OA Alliance will make in the plan is driving advanced scientific understanding. So things like long-term monitoring, whether it be biological monitoring at the reefs or water chemistry. Other actions include reducing local pollution. So having strategies to limit nutrient runoff or something like a ridge to reef program. Another action would include protecting the environment and coastal communities, like exploring uh, growing seagrass beds and restoring mangrove ecosystems. Action five is expanding public awareness, so facilitating the understanding of drivers and impacts of OA and finally, sustaining international support. So engaging with international knowledge exchange networks. So these actions are commitments, essentially, that you would have to make if you wanted to join the OA Alliance. But all the plans for each country are different. And on the website, there's some examples, if that's something that you would be interested to look at. So speaking of using your EOV data to make policy and legislation, I want to reiterate my invitation to join us on Friday the 26th to the Transforming Science into Policy Workshop. And we want you to just come and tell us what you need in terms of science or what you want to explore to make your ocean a healthier place and for you to just come and talk to us about some policies you have. On, on any of the subjects we're going to cover. We are just really interested to hear what's going on for you and if there's anything that we can do to help or collaborate with in the future. So if you're definitely going to come and join with a presentation, for example, for five minutes, then please, if you can, just email Alan Evans, just so we can make a bit of a running program of who wants to talk. So to summarize, Anthropogenic stresses are causing a really long list of problems for coastal seas, coastal ecosystems, and the local communities that rely on coastal resources for their livelihood. Essential ocean variables are parameters known to be critical for observing and monitoring marine ecosystems. You can find more about them through the specification sheets. And this observational data can be used to guide policy to protect ecosystems and protect 
food security. And there's lots of resources available online for all of these different types of EOVs. So I think we're going to have one more break and then we're going to come back and talk more about just some additional projects outside of CMEP. So we've got some real life examples of collecting ocean data that's being transformed for sustainable development and helping communities. So we will see you back here in 10 minutes. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about Earth observation of ocean um, variables. So looking at the ocean from satellites. So um, Earth observation or satellite remote sensing is an increasingly important element of ocean and coastal observing networks or offering synoptic views of large areas, good spatial and temporal resolution and sustained time series. So you can view the ocean for uh, variables over several years and even decades. Satellite observations are routinely used to provide information on several essential ocean variables. We can use satellites to collect data on sea level, sea surface temperature, ocean winds, waves and surface currents, water quality parameters, the coastline, land cover, shallow water bathymetry and benthic habitats. I should also say that it's, um, it's often very useful to use satellite observation alongside in situ observations and model data. Um, in situ observations help us validate the satellite data. So here are some um, quick examples of the, the types of data that we have. So um, this image here um, shows the change in sea level globally from 1992 to 2018. And that supports the, the ocean decade by helping to deliver a safe ocean where people are protected from ocean hazards. This image shows uh, the sea surface temperature globally, which supports the decade by helping deliver a predictable ocean where society has the capacity to understand current and future ocean conditions. And here we have an ocean color image. So you can see some lines on the image here um, and, and some variations in color, um, which might show um, fronts or where there's chlorophyll um, in the water and also um, where, where the reefs are. So where the ocean might be more productive. Um, and it can also show um, where there's sediment um, and where there might be pollution occurring. So this supports the decade by helping deliver a clean ocean where sources of pollution are identified and removed. There are large volumes of data openly available along um, with processing toolkits and online learning resources. So I've put some examples here. So we've got the European Space Agency Climate Change Initiative, Copernicus Marine Monitoring Service, the Ocean Virtual Lab, which is shown here in the picture, Sentinel Hub, and Learn EO. So you might want to explore some of these links uh, to access data and, and learning resources. And this supports the decade by delivering a transparent ocean with open access to data, information, and technologies. The European Space Agency, ESA, are supporting a number of initiatives seeking to maximize the use of Earth observation in support of sustainable development objectives. The National Oceanography Centre are leading one of these projects, EO for SD Marine and Coastal, which is, delivered, which is delivering a suite of satellite services processed by leading technical experts from research institutes, universities, and specialist consultancies. These services support development investment activities and in parallel, the project provides training and technical support to increase the capacity to work with EO locally. The 
The National Oceanography Centre with EO for SD Marine and Coastal is currently working with the OECS to support the delivery of the Caribbean Regional Oceanscapes Project, CROP, providing data sets for integration into the main spatial planning process. So there are a couple of images um, from that data here. One of them shows, uh, on the left-hand side, shows the chlorophyll concentration, and the other on the right-hand side shows suspended sediment. And there's a, a link there to the, to the site that will allow you to explore that data further. The ambition of the final year of the EO for SD project is to ensure that our activities reach the organisations and individuals within the Caribbean region that can benefit directly from the expertise within the project either through connecting to existing earth observation user networks or by establishing a regional earth observation user group. That can enhance and accelerate the use of earth observation for the benefit of the region in the drive towards sustainable ocean development. Interested in hearing about projects or initiatives which might benefit from access to data or opportunities to collaborate particularly in applications which can combine earth observation with other data sets. And as I said, the links are on the screen um, to the data set, or you can contact Christine Sams at the email address given. Well, thank you very much for your attention on that. There will be more um, information on earth observation I think next on next Monday's session. Um, I think that's the correct day. <laughs> um, and we're doing we're doing some capacity building on earth observation. So I'll just hand back to Sarah now to close the session off, unless anyone of course has any questions. <laughs> yeah, if there's any more questions, then just stick them in the chat. Like I say, we've appreciated your interaction over the chat so far. So keep that up for the rest of the week. We love to hear your questions and comments. Uh, thank you all for joining us on the first day of our workshop. Sorry, I'm just reading the questions. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining on the first day. We hope that we've just kind of set the scene for the rest of the workshop. So why we're interested in doing all this science and collaboration and capacity building. I really look forward to seeing you in, in the more nitty gritty sessions throughout the rest of the week. So tomorrow we're going to be learning about the ocean acidification kit. It's mostly for those of you who already have one as we're going to talk to you about upgrading the equipment and what's coming in, in your shipment. But it's also available for anybody who may want to measure pH with us in the future. So please check out the timetable and what sessions you're booked in for. And we'll see you for the next couple of weeks. <laughs>